So, Masters of the Universe Revelation Part 2 finally dropped on Netflix earlier this week. And all I can say is that if Netflix had given us all 10 episodes all at once, or perhaps even given us an episode a week for 10 weeks, then they might have saved themselves and Kevin Smith some negative backlash. Splitting the series in two like this did them no favours whatsoever. Now, I'm not going to give uh, a deep dive of each episode, but there will be plenty of spoilers here, so be warned if you haven't watched the show already. So, how did part two of Revelation fare? Did it bring the series to a satisfying conclusion? Will He-Man fans be happy with this series now? Well, let's take a look. As I mentioned in my previous He-Man related video, the trailer for Revelation Part 2 did give away loads of spoilers. For example, the savage He-Man, Orko and Adam coming back from the dead, both Evil Lynn and Teela at some point becoming the new sorceress, etc etc. I wasn't even surprised when Skeletor killed the sorceress of Greyskull, it was just something that I predicted just from watching the trailer. And as mentioned before, this isn't the first time that the Sorceress of Greyskull has been killed off in order to make way for Teela to take over that mantle. However, the show did have a few extra surprises up its sleeve, like Adam and Skeletor actually joining forces, and Sorceress Evil Lynn calling on the power of Greyskull to become a godlike being herself. However, there were a few problems with this. If Evil Lynn now had all this power, why did she bother wasting her time engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Adam and Skeletor? Could she have just done what Thanos did in Avengers Infinity War and simply snapped her fingers, reducing them both to dust? At this point, Evil Lynn was so powerful that she destroyed Preternia, essentially Eternia's version of Heaven, of Asgard, with a mere gesture. So why were two mortal men and an oversized cat now giving her so much trouble? And speaking of the power, when Adam finally gets the sword back and becomes He-Man, and when Teela finally becomes the new sorceress, what exactly was stopping them from essentially just taking that power away from Skeletor and Evil Lynn? One of the main themes throughout the five episodes was not only the power of Greyskull, but how others used it. For example, as Man at Arms brilliantly put it, Adam is the hero, not because he has the power, but because of how he uses it. He never used the power for himself, only when someone else needed it, and he always let the power return afterwards. This would explain why, in part one, when Teela went to Preternia, it showed that Adam was the only person there that was in his powered down version of himself. Whilst all the other heroes of Greyskull, like King Greyskull and Wundam and Vicar, were these huge muscular men going out on, on hunting trips, Adam was there as himself, as Adam, and not as He-Man, thus showing that Adam would never use the power for his own needs, but for others. While Skeletor, on the other hand, hoards all the power for himself and only wants more. Even with all the powers and secrets of Greyskull, it still isn't enough for him. He still wants more. He is still obsessed with He-Man. This was how Skeletor was like in the Masters of the Universe movie from 1987. In that film, he had control of Greyskull, he was ruling over Eternia, but it was never enough for him. He still wanted He-Man in chains, kneeling at his feet. And like in that film, this obsession is what leads to Skeletor's downfall. You would wonder what would happen to Skeletor if he finally got rid of He-Man once and for all. Would he be happy? Somehow, I don't think he would. Skeletor has a lot in common with the Joker, other than Mark Hamill doing his voice. If the Joker no longer had Batman to battle against, I think he would be absolutely miserable and would struggle to find purpose in his life. 
and the same can be said of Skeletor with He-Man. Indeed, Skeletor only ever let the power return because he thought that sex was on the cards with Evil Lynn. <laughs> Typical bloke. I have to say though, they did mess up on how Evil Lynn met Skeletor for the first time. In previous He-Man related media, such as the comic books and the 2000X series, she met Skeletor when he was known as Keldor, and they first become lovers. He recruited her when he was gathering warriors to challenge King Randall for the throne of Eternia. But when Keldor became Skeletor, he completely lost that romantic side to him. Although, at this point, we do see that Skeletor is wearing the logo of the Horde, which seems to be an early warning of what we're going to see right at the end of part two. More on that in a moment. Something else that didn't quite match up from what had been established before was the sorceress taking on her duties at Castle Grayskull after she became a mother. Whilst before, she was already the sorceress when she gave birth to Teela. Now, that would make more sense if the sorceress gave birth while she still had all her powers, as it would explain how Teela would then already have these powers herself and how she was able to defeat Evil Lin in the final episode. Essentially, she's had these powers since birth. Teela also becomes the only sorceress that can leave Castle Grayskull, but it doesn't really get explained why or how. These are little points that could have been tidied up in the writing, I feel. Little tweaks that could have been made there to explain things. And perhaps whilst the writing was being tidied up, Maybe they could have given Ram Man war lines to say. Seriously, you got Danny Trejo to voice Ram Man and you gave him just one line? It also would have been better in the ending if we saw Teela restoring Preternia after Evil Lynn destroyed it. I would have also liked to have seen if Fisto and Clampchamp made it to Preternia to hang out with the likes of King Grayskull and the other heroes. A Skeletor had previously stated that their souls had been sent to Subternia, the Underworld. I would have liked to have seen these heroes being rewarded for their noble sacrifice. Uh, Fisto and Clampchamp were like two of my uh, favourite characters from the original toy line, so I was great to see them uh, getting this uh, scene together in part two. And uh, when they were turned into undead minions of Skeletor, and ended up being destroyed. I think I might have been as, as heartbroken as what I was when Orko was apparently killed off. It's like, no, I can't, but the, the sorcerer's getting killed off. I saw that coming. But when you killed off Fisto and Clamchop, it's like, no, I can't believe you've killed off those two characters. Uh, but of course, that wasn't the ending. Just when you thought that this story had come to a conclusion, we get that very last scene where Skeletor returned to Snake Mountain. Now I thought that we were done with Triclops and his weird little cult that worshipped technology. But no, oh no, we're not quite done yet. It looks like we'll have another villain to contend with in what is now going to be a second season. Watch out folks, because Hordak is coming. See, it was moments like that throughout part two which made me say out loud, holy shit, I can't believe that's happening. So, yes, in terms of the storytelling, uh, although there are a few points, as I mentioned before, that could and should have been included, I was glad to see that they didn't try and cram everything in there that didn't need to be there. Uh, this was something that I had concerns about when I saw the trailer for part two, as I mentioned in my previous video. I am overall very happy with how part two played out, and I am very glad that I didn't judge part one too harshly and that I waited until the story was complete first. Although again, splitting into two parts really did not do them any favours, uh, and I do feel that if they'd have given us all ten episodes at once, it probably would have stopped from stopped some of this negativity. I feel like it would have stopped some of these uh, negative comments and feedback coming from the He-Man fans. Both Teela and Evil Lynn are given rich backstories and become more fleshed out characters, rather than being the sidekick, of the main hero or villain. By benefit of Evil Lynn's development as a character, even Beastman can ascend to becoming a more interesting character as well, whilst Man at Arms is able to have a lot of meaningful moments as well. 
In conclusion, although I will always prefer the 80s Filmation cartoon and the 2000 X series from Mike Young Productions, I mean, I've spoken of that particular series enough times already, although I will always prefer those two uh, iterations of He-Man, Revelation has proven to be an excellent addition to the old He-Man formula. With a combination of rich characters, eye-popping animation, and some unexpected twists and turns, I can safely say that Revelation is no longer the black sheep of the Masters of the Universe franchise. Oh no, that accolade belongs to a different series. But that's for another video in the future, I fear. Anyway, that is the end of another little analysis slash rant on He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Thank you to everyone that has taken the time to watch this video and my other He-Man related videos. If you have enjoyed this video then please take the time to leave a like and a comment. Please also consider sharing this video across your social media, your Facebook, your Twitter, your Reddit etc etc. Uh, in particular with anything that is related to He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. And uh, why not subscribe to the channel as well in order to see my other videos. But for now, thank you very much for stopping by the Big Daddy D Reviews channel and we'll catch you again next time.